So next we have the overview of the first, I'm sorry, we have the Tangerine SDR data engine and overall architecture. And this is going to be by Scotty Cowling, WA2DFI uh, of the Tapper Group. So Tapper is an amateur electrical engineering uh, organization or group. And Scotty can explain a little bit more about what Tapper is. And Tapper is responsible for developing the performance-based side of the personal space weather station. So take it away, Scotty. Okay, can you hear me okay? Okay, well, thank you, Nathaniel. And uh, I've got a lot of slides to cover, so uh, uh, my apologies if I go uh, kind of fast. A couple of them uh, do uh, dwell on what Nathaniel has said, or they're kind of copies of them, so uh, I can go through them pretty fast, but we'll, uh, get started now with kind of a hardware overview of the uh, the architecture and the, uh, the way we split the board up into modular pieces here. In fact, I'm going to move my camera over here. Be a little bit better for so I can look at at everyone instead of looking over at the wrong screen. Okay, Let's see if I can advance this. Okay, so what is a tangerine SDR? You may have heard of what a uh, heard the term tangerine SDR. Um, basically, I'll go over the uh, the features of the tangerine real quick here. And uh, personal space weather station is only one of the use cases we have for the tangerine SDR. The idea being that the more use cases we can come up with, the more of these we can build, and therefore the cheaper they'll be. And of course, we've got the uh, five hundred dollar price target for the SDR which I think we're gonna be able to beat. And um, we may have some uh, less performant uh, versions that will be close to the $300 range if we can do it. As in shown down here is the second bullet item. But the idea is if you want high performance and you want uh, lots of features and sensors, you'll be able to add them on. And uh, you could easily, uh, as we all know about ham radios, you can buy the low end one or you can buy the stripped down one that has no options, or you can load, load it all up and you can spend a lot more money, get a lot more performance. We'll be all open source, uh, open source hardware and open source software. And hopefully when we get done, it will be advancing the state of the radio art. So what are we going to have? Like Nathaniel said, a small footprint, reasonably low power consumption. Modular is the keyword here. So you can add features or delete features uh, to basically build the kind of station, kind of software to radio that you want that does the, the functions that you want without having to pay for things that you don't want. Uh, Web-based user interface for ease of configuration on a local display and the built-in networking interface to the data cloud, which is the big data that Nathaniel was referring to, to be able to store uh, multiple formats of data. So here are some of the other target applications. Of course, the HAMSI Personal Space Weather Station is what we're going to talk about today. It's the first one on, on our list of, um, of target applications. But uh, the idea is to keep it modular and flexible enough and programmable enough to fulfill these other use cases. For instance, a satellite ground station or academic uses or just a regular amateur SDR that you might want to uh, put together. I know there's, there's lots of them to choose from, so we like to have a nice feature set for uh, amateur experimenters. Okay, so for general amateur use, uh, what we're planning to, to, to do here is not only provide the personal space weather station functionality, but provide more functionality that average hams might want. So you're gonna lay out four or $500 for the station. You know, you're, you're probably gonna to wanna to do more than just collect personal space weather station data. So uh, we're gonna build in WhisperNet and reverse beacon network functionality and uh, digital modes at least monitoring digital modes, because the, the first unit out of the door is gonna be just a receiver. So we'll be able to monitor digital modes, but we won't be able to actually transmit beacons. And since this is software defined radio, we're gonna be able to concurrently collect data for, for the personal space weather station project, as well as FT8 and the other amateur radio modes. And we can do this on multiple bands simultaneously since the architecture is a direct sampling receiver. 
Okay, so this is kind of a uh, a uh, enhanced version of the uh, the block diagram that Nathaniel showed, and so uh, we split this up into a data engine and a single board computer. And the idea is that I can build the single board computer functionality into the data engine, but it costs so much, and single board computers are so cheap. Why do that when you can buy a Raspberry Pi or an Odroid for well under a hundred dollars? And get functionality that you couldn't get any uh, any cheaper way. So, what are we going to build now? After all that uh, talk, this is the uh, basic block diagram, the data engine board on the left, and these RF modules and clock modules. These are plug-in modules here. You can see my cursor going over them, and we connect this with a three-part gigabit Ethernet switch to a single board computer, so we have a single Ethernet connection to the local network. So the Tangerine SDR system really is going to require a single board computer to do all of the networking and a lot of the data crunching, whereas the data engine and the RF modules and the clock module are going to be responsible for acquiring the data and applying timestamps to it and formatting it. So now we go into uh, lots of details, which I hope I don't go too fast, but these slides are up on uh, the net. So uh, Nathaniel uh, can, uh, when we get done here, Nathaniel can tell you where you can get those. The PDFs of this presentation are up online. So uh, the data engine, I'm gonna talk about different pieces of it. We'll start with the FPGA, a field programmable gate array and a three port gigabit ethernet switch. We're gonna use an Altera Max 10 uh, 50,000 logic elements, uh, largest Max 10 FPGA that they make in a 672 pin package. They're going to have uh, some SD RAM and some flash memory. The flash memory is chiefly going to be used to store additional FPGA configurations while the SD RAM is likely going to be used to buffer data. And then some serial EEPROM and lots of people laugh at me but when you see a part like this and it costs 30 cents, you don't ask too many questions about why you might put it on your board because it's cheap and we need uh, additional configuration memory. We may need this. So this is what it's there for. Okay, a wide voltage input. So we're gonna have a station supply to be able to run it. Again, I told you about the three port gigabit ethernet switch, which allows you to connect up a single board computer and connect the Tangerine system to your local network without having to have an external switch. We're also gonna have a cryptographic processor with, a key, with key storage. The main thing this part brings to us is a 72-bit unique serial number. Temperature sensors and power, and these are just standard things that you put on, on most every board, very inexpensive. And so now get into the uh, more the meat of it is, uh, how are we gonna acquire the RF? And uh, we're gonna have two RF module slots um, and they're gonna use 140 pin MEC connectors. You can either use one for transmit and one for receive or you can use two receivers. The first module we're gonna make is, uh, I'm gonna show you in a second, is a dual channel receiver. So even uh, using only one slot, you're still gonna get two synchronous receive channels that will cover 100 kilohertz to 60 megahertz, 55 megahertz. Okay, so the, and then uh, Tom McDermott is going to talk about this in uh, a few minutes in much more detail than this, but basically it's going to be a 14 bit, a dual 14 bit, 122.88 mega sample per second ADC. We're going to have a, a selectable or switchable attenuator and a 20 dB uh, low noise amp. The amp is in circuit all the time and the attenuator is ahead of the amplifier. So uh, it saves us the uh, problem of switching the amplifier in and out a fixed 55 megahertz low pass filter, but then we're gonna have an optional user defined plug-in filter that's gonna be on headers. So if you live near a broadcast station, you could put a broadcast band notch filter in. Um, we've actually run power to it. So if you really want to, to build a, an active preamp on the uh, user defined plug-in filter block, you can do that also. We also are gonna have, we, we have an onboard switchable 50 ohm calibration noise source that uh, can be switched in and out with software so we can calibrate the front end of the radio. And this is a block diagram of the uh, 
the RF module. Now, again, I said these are modular, so this is the first one of many is what our hope is, that we will be able to, to tailor these to whatever application where we are uh, we're trying to implement. Okay, so future ones might be, uh, like I said, for satellite. Uh, some of these, um, these ICs made by line microsystems, and uh, this one's made by analog devices, the 809361. These are complete transceiver systems on a single chip. And we've tried to make the connector pinouts as, as flexible as we can so that we have allowed these partic particular chips to be implemented in an RF, future RF module. So uh, look for these coming along in the future to give you a lot more expanded capability. And Tom uh, McDermott will uh, be providing more detail on the RF module. Uh, it's uh, special thanks to Tom for uh, his RF expertise in, uh, in designing this module, as you'll see when, when we get to his presentation here. Okay, moving along, uh, the clock module is, is next up. So uh, the clock module is one of those variable things that if you want just a regular simple receiver, you don't need a particularly high performance one. But generally on a direct sampling SDR, the performance of the SDR is not only defined by the A to D performance, but by the performance of the clock module. In other words, how clean is it? How jitter free is it? Et cetera. So, and usually it comes down to the more money you spend, the better clock you get. So, we want to make the clock module good enough, but not generally better than necessary because it just is gonna cost more money. So the first case is no clock module. So for the low cost version, we have an onboard TCXO that we can use that will replace the clock module for general purpose use, not particularly stellar, but adequate and certainly low cost. If you want more performance than that, then what you do is you plug in a, clock, a modular clock module. And the idea is to build several versions of these, one of them to satisfy the requirements of the personal space weather station, and other one to satisfy uh, other use cases that we have mentioned earlier. And uh, this is really a work in progress at this time. And uh, I'll show you, this is kind of a, a basic block diagram. Thanks to NAUR for this, for drawing this up. But this is, uh, basically the performance clock module. And the idea here is that we, we will take this board, this design, and we will depopulate pieces of it to make different clock modules in different price ranges and different performance ranges. So we can perhaps use one copper layout to satisfy several different use cases. And John will be talking about the clock module later on today. And again, thanks to John, too, for taking on the clock module design. He's uh, very well versed in, uh, in clock and timing. He belongs to a group called Time Nuts, which explains a lot. But we'll, I'll let him go into that. OK, a little bit different view of the uh, modular solution here. The center board here is the data engine with uh, gigabit Ethernet off to the side to the single board computer. Also, we have low speed connections to the single board computer like uh, UARTs and spy ports and things like that. Uh, and we also include, and I think this is the only board that I know of this made that includes USB 3 and gigabit Ethernet both for their communications ports. And you can see that uh, we also have a, uh, a low speed IO. I call it, it's, it's, I call it low speed IO because it's low speed compared to the RF modules which are down here on the lower left. The MEC has uh, been deleted, and I, so I won't go into that. But the idea here is we get low speed um, Raspberry Pi level IO like uh, I2C and spy ports. But then we have so also have some high speed IO from an expansion card that's a little bit bigger than the Raspberry Pi hat. And I'll get into that in just a second. OK, so uh, communications interfaces of true five gigabit per second full duplex, one lane, one lane in, one lane out, a USB 3 device interface. We also added a USB 2 host interface. So if you have an RTL SDR dongle, you'll be able to plug that into that port and you'll be able to do things with the RTL data that you can't really do on a Raspberry Pi because you'll have an FPGA at your disposal to process the data and format it. And again, dual gigabit RJ45 ports. And their aggregate, um, 
one gigabit because it's a shared switch. So, okay, and I'd uh, like to go into a little bit of detail on the low speed IO. Uh, we can handle st standard low speed IO connections like you're all familiar with on the Raspberry Pi, UART connections, and I2C connections. Typically, they're below four megabits per second. Some of them are a little faster than that. But it's generally used for sensors and things like that that don't have to be read at high rate of speed. And for things like uh, PTT and a, and a keyer paddle and the P, uh, power amplifier key, things that are relatively low speed. So what we've done is we've said, okay, you can plug a Raspberry Pi hat onto the expansion connector and pick up all the low speed IO that is on this blue connector here. But if you want to, to build it, if you, we will build a custom board that has an extension on it that has a high speed connector down on the bottom. So now you not only get all the Raspberry Pi low speed connectors, all the data, but you get a high speed, uh, some number of LVDS lanes that are high speed coming in on the high speed connector. So that really expands the capabilities of what you could put on this Pi hat uh, leaf type format of board. So again, low speed direct support for uh, Raspberry Pi type connectors and then what you can do is you can take, we, we can build a leaf board that will have all of these different shields. Shields, I guess they call it a shield or a cape or uh, there's lots of different names for them. But you basically just make it a connector translator and uh, then you can use any of these option boards that are, and there's thousands of them available. And these will be generally for low speed IO and sensors and things like that. So what are we going to have in the future for Tangerine? Larger, faster FPGAs, more RAM, uh, maybe a, an, an SSD port for storing data locally, um, perhaps higher speed uh, data ports because gigabit Ethernet scales very nicely to 10 gig E and then 40 gig E, et cetera, et cetera. So that's uh, kind of a look at the future. But the idea is to preserve the clock module and RF module ports so you can use the same acquisition boards that you use now in the same clock module that you use today. This is kind of a mechanical layout. This is kind of hard to see in, in, uh, on a flat screen, but the uh, red here is a leaf board. The orange subset of it is the Raspberry Pi hat. Then down here in the green is the clock module. And the RF modules exist on the back side of the board. You can see the blue outlines down here. These are the RF module connectors. And the RF modules are behind the data engine. And the black outline here is the data engine. And to give you an idea, this is a, a roughly 100 to 120 millimeters square. So four to five inches square. So now this is probably the question you're all uh, wanting to ask. But when can you get one? I think this has already been asked. So this is kind of the schedule that we have. And we're trying to beat the schedule, but uh, I, I won't promise that I can, I can come out ahead. And since Hamvention is canceled, and, and in fact, it, almost everything is canceled, but this great convention here, it gives me more time to work on this, so we may be able to accelerate it some. But certainly by the Digital Communications Conference in September, we will have all of these pieces, in, uh, if not in production, at least prototypes that you can look at. And uh, again, tangerinesdr.com for more information. Pretty much everything uh, is put up there by uh, our awesome webmaster, KV0S, who's got videos and um, specs and links to TeamSpeak sessions, which are here. And actually, you don't really need to know this because on tangerinesdr.com, this information is all up there, so you can find it there. And we have a TeamSpeak session every Monday evening at 2100 Eastern time nine o'clock Eastern time. You're welcome to join, listen, talk, um, whatever you like, everyone's welcome. And that's uh, all I have here. So uh, any questions, we'll be willing to take them.